Our series of general manager interviews here continues on a special edition of PFTPM. Joining us now, the first year GM for the New York football giants. He is Joe Shane. And you already, you already have mastered Coughlin time. I know it's been a long time since Coach Coughlin's been there, but you're ready to go. You're ready to go seven minutes before the appointed time. I applaud <laughs> you for your punctuality. Mike, I know you're a busy man. I'm just pr- trying to be respective of your time. And I thought if I showed up early, maybe this would help you in the long run. Or you thought if I show up early, it'll get done sooner, right? The yeah, sooner yeah, I yeah, exactly. Yeah, thing. okay. Like the root canal. We start the root canal early. The sooner the root canal's over, let's exactly. get the root canal started. All right. Exactly. Um, you got a draft under your belt. First time you're the guy in charge running the show. What's the biggest lesson you learned about yourself, about the game, about anything going through that process as the guy sitting in the GM chair? Yeah, really the biggest uh, adjustment for me was trying to balance, you know, the the new scouting staff and the new coaching staff. And, you know, typically when you go through the draft, you know, you know that your roster, like the back of your hand and you've, you've, you've had experiences, practice games with these players. So along with your staff and it's, you know, getting to know Wink Martindale and his staff and, you know, I, offense was a little bit easier for me. I have to admit, cause I had, I'd worked with Dayball before, which was easy, but a whole group of, of scouts as well. And trying to balance, you know, who, who are the really good scouts at getting background and who are the really good evaluators and trying to set the board with, you know, people you've never worked with. So, um, you know, coming from Buffalo where we had a lot of continuity on the staff and we had been together for a while, that was probably the biggest adjustment, just going through the process, getting to know the staff and, you know, what exactly we were looking for from a schematic standpoint from the coaching part. We got a little news from the Giants before the draft began. It was announced or leaked. I can't remember quite exactly how it got out, but the idea that the Daniel Jones fifth-year option would not be picked up. Now, we had talked about that scouting combine. You had pointed out you'd have some time with them in the building. You wanted to wait to make a decision until you had to. End of the day, why was the decision made not to exercise that prerogative at one more year, $22 million and change guaranteed, why not pick up that option? What was your your reasoning? Yeah, the, the, the twenty two million. I mean, that's a that's a large number, but you know, again, we're we're excited about working with Daniel. We're, we're we're happy where he is. This isn't an indictment on who Daniel is as, as a person or anything like that. We're we're really happy with what Daniel's done for us um, throughout the process when we've had him over the three months, getting to know him and being in the building for four weeks now and and the off season program. And we like everything he's doing. We're excited to work with him. We just thought that that was the best decision right now for for where we are moving forward. Um, again, we're excited to work with him. We, you know, we've upgraded the offensive line. We like some of the weapons that we have around him. And again, we want to see uh, Daniel be able to put his best foot forward. And I think we've done that this off season, but um, that decision was just what was best for us right now. It's a balancing act, right? You've got the 22 million fully guaranteed if it's mm-hmm. exercised. So you don't do that. The other side of it is he goes out and he balls out this year. Then you got yeah, that'd problem. be great. I guess you yeah. call that the good problem to have. Good problem. Yeah, it's a good have. problem to have. And you got the franchise. You know, you also got the franchise tag if you needed a year from now. That that you know, that's a, a gamble. You know, say it's a eight million dollar gamble, or you know, you're talking to his representatives and you're trying to get an extension. You know, he's uh, Patrick Collins represents him and Jim Denton, two agents. You know, just worked with recently over there in Buffalo with. Patrick Collins actually uh, represents Josh Allen as well, but Jim Denton have a good relationship with him, and you know, hopefully we've. We've set Daniel up for success with, you know, again, you know, improving the offensive line, the weapons that are here, um, you know, Saquon another year off off the knee and he'll be able to put his best foot forward. That's a that's a good problem to have if we got to figure out, you know, how we're going to how we're going to pay him, how we're going to structure a contract. It's a franchise tag. Um, That'll be a good problem to have. Is part of the decision. Let's see how he does with that carrot with that incentive he knows nothing is guaranteed to him beyond this year let's see how he chases that goal he's i don't think daniel needs motivation i think he's a naturally motivated kid he's 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 a self-starter he's in here all the time i i I don't think daniel needed any incentive to go out and um perform at a high level i think he truly wants to be great Uh, he approaches the game like that and um, although it may be an incentive, I, I don't think he's a kid that, that, that needs an, an incentive or a carrot out there to go to go both perform well. How influenced were you? This is the last question on this. How in, I have famous last words. How influenced were you by some of the other examples we've seen? Bears didn't pick it up on Mitchell Trubisky and we're glad they didn't. Browns pick it up on Baker Mayfield. Regret. Panthers pick it up on Sam Darnold. 
regret? Do you factor those other experiences into your decision-making process? No, I mean, I, you look at that when, when those teams make those decisions and, you know, that's, it's the quarterback position and that's a large number. So yeah, you pay attention across the league, but you know, this, we looked at what was best for the New York giants and the situation where again, and listen, we've known Daniel for three months, look forward to working with him. And, you know, we just thought this was the, the, the best option for us moving forward. Now it's the last one. See, anytime I say last one, I know there's always going to be, I always know there's going to be another. I don't know why I say it. Pre-2020, if picking up that option is guaranteed for injury only, do you pick it up? I, I think we were, again, I think the decision we made, we, you know, we're, we're comfortable with it, whether there was, you know, option, pre-option or not. I, I think we're comfortable with the decision we made. I, you know, that's a hypothetical. So I'm, I had, I, I think we would still make the same decision. You play the Packers in London. We found that out earlier today. How do you feel about, number one, taking the operation to London, and number two, getting the Packers there instead of at Lambeau Field? Yeah, I mean, it's – whenever you go to Lambeau, it's kind of a catch-20. I, I don't like playing there because it's hard to win there. It's, it's hard to play there, but – uh, that's one of my favorite stadiums in the league, the, the history of that stadium and driving through a small community. You know, it's a little bit like Buffalo when you're going up to the stadium, you know, you're driving through, you know, blue collar town, um, you know, just, just all the history there. I love it. So uh, going to London, on the other hand, I, I like it. I'm excited about it. You know, it's our first year. I've been there a couple of times when I was with the Dolphins. Um, you know, hopefully the Giants fans show up in droves over there. And, uh, you know, it'd be a fun, it'd be a good experience for, you know, first year head coach, you know, first year GM, our first um, time going through it with the, the, the players that we have. So, you know, hopefully it'll form some team bonding as well as we go over there. It'll be a great experience. I've asked your former colleague, Brandon Bean, this question, Brett Veach, George Payton, just a little bit ago. When that schedule comes out May 12th, and you, you get it, whether you get it in advance or right when everyone else sees it or whenever you get it, what's the first thing you're going to look for? That's a good question. Um, really, for me, the first thing that I'll look for is our, our division games. You know, when those, when those are, I know we'll probably have some late in the season, but, you know, I think that's where it starts, competing for the division. If, you, if you're able to compete for the division, win the division, I think the rest takes care of itself. So I always go right to the division and see how that lines up when we play those teams and, and what that'll look like. Well, one of the teams in the division, the Dallas Cowboys, they had an interesting development during the draft where Jerry Jones held up his draft board long enough for somebody to take a picture of it. And then they tried to discern what was on there. And as it turns out, their top two players were your first two picks. <laughs> they had came on Thibodeau one and Evan Neal two. And I was saying that earlier today, boy, they had to, they had to be cussing up a storm when they saw that the giants got both of their top two guys on their draft board. Yeah. I, I love it. I, I hope, I hope the Cowboys were right in the way they had guys ranked. <laughs> yeah. That'd be a good story to have, but it's funny. Uh, Will McClay is a good friend of mine. I've known him a long time and we were trying to move up uh, later on in the draft and uh, you know, might've been fourth or fifth round. And I said, Will, I said, I'm down to the last name on your list that Jerry showed us. I said, I don't know what's on the back. Can you, can you let me know what's on the back of that sheet? And uh, he got a good laugh out of it, but uh, yeah, Will McClay is a good buddy of mine and it'll be fun competing against him a couple of times a year. But I, I did see that report today that those, those two guys were top on their list. That was pretty funny. Kayvon Thibodeau was a surprise for a lot of people because he was the, the puzzle going into the draft. He was the guy at one point was the favorite to be the number one overall pick. We see him number one on the Cowboys draft board. There was talk he's going to fall out of the top 10. What, what caused you to, to be attracted by the positives, set aside the negatives, and make him the guy when you had a chance to make your pick at five? Yeah, there weren't, there weren't many negatives going through the process. Again, just everybody's different, you know, in terms of personality and, and how you are in certain settings. So he, he's a guy we spent a lot of time with. Um, you know, from the combine to, you know, go, taking him out to dinner at his pro day to bringing him in, uh, Zooms with him, you know, FaceTime. So we spent a lot of time with him. You know, he's always had good grades in school. He's never been in trouble. He's a hard worker. He, he had an ankle injury this year. Um, a lot of people that are going to be high picks easily could have hung it up and, and called it a season. And, you know, but this kid fought, fought back. He practiced through it, um, eventually came back and played late in the season. So, yeah, you know, for, for whatever, you know, the draft season and the, the misinformation that gets out there, you know, it's unfortunate. But, you know, we did a lot of research. We felt comfortable with the kid. And, you know, we obviously were comfortable with the player. You know, we think he's going to be a good fit for us. I always think when I hear the negatives get pushed by people in the media that there's somebody on the other side of the top 10 that hopes like hell 
he falls out of the top 10 so they can get him that that's yeah. usually who's behind him. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. We'd heard again, the way it worked out, there were, there were some teams that were behind us that were targeting, you know, that six range, you know, Carolina had a one and a four, would, you know, would they maybe move back if a team, you know, trades up into six. So um, we had definitely heard teams behind us were interested in him and, you know, depending on who went one or two, it was an interesting draft that you didn't know necessarily who was going to go one or two there, you know, there weren't any quarterbacks or necessarily consensus one, two or three, you know, if, if Hutchinson would have went one, you know, what would Detroit have done? You know, would, would Thibodeau have went there or would they have went Walker? And then you're going through all these scenarios. So, you know, if Thibodeau did fall, you know, now what's it look like behind us now that a team can go to six instead of all the way up to two or three, you know, potentially draft him. Chris Sims and I interviewed Thibodeau Super Bowl week, not in person via Zoom like this, but I got the impression he's very gregarious, personable, smart, funny. Does that factor in for you, knowing the market you're in, the exposure the players will have? They got to be able to hold their own dealing with the media. Does that become a factor for you, especially for a high profile pick? Yeah. And I think, it, I think it does for every, every team. You know, I was, um, you know, when I was down in Miami uh, with the dolphins, that was always something. Can he handle South beach? Will this kid be able to survive in Miami? How will he be in, you know, that scene? Okay. And then you go to Buffalo. Um, some people are, Hey, that's, that's, that's the ideal place for him because there's not as much going on or, or a player. So whichever team you're in, whatever city you're in, you, you always take in, the environment, the outside surroundings, you got to think, uh, you know, will this player be able to succeed? Um, you know, will football still be important to him? And again, Kayvon's from LA. There's plenty of stuff going on in LA. Um, he grew up in, in that environment, you know, big city. And, you know, I think he'll just be fine in New York. And, you know, we were comfortable with that fit. He told us he's a Rams fan, but he didn't want to play for the Rams because he didn't want to pay California state income tax. So he's got to be happy. <laughs> still got to pay a little chunk in New Jersey, yeah, 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 yeah. but not like yeah. he'd have to pay in California. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, either of those places will be in for a little bit of a surprise. You mentioned Carolina at six. You guys had five and seven. End of the day, why did you go D-line five instead of O-line five? Because you're taking a risk, obviously, that you're going to not get both of the guys you wanted. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And it, it goes back to a little bit what we just said when we were talking about, you know, Kayvon at five. There was some concern. There were you know, rumors of some teams behind us that may be trying to get up into that six slot. Um, and we knew, you know, we went through, you know, a bunch of different scenarios. If both tackles were there and the pass rusher, um, we were going to go with the pass rusher knowing we would still get a really good player um, at seven. And, you know, the way it went, it worked out. You know, we'd been through that scenario a hundred times and we would be comfortable um, with either tackle depending on how it played out. I've heard Evan Neal was your top guy. Now, look, nothing against Iki Aquanu. You got to have one guy above the other. And I don't expect you to say, no, he wasn't our top guy. But I get the feeling you're happy with the way it played out. Yeah, we're, we're, we're static the way it played out. And, you know, again, we're happy to have Evan Neal. Again, a guy that started 40 games at Alabama, you know, against some of the best competition in one of the best conferences. You know, he played left tackle, guard, and right tackle. So the experience, the durability, he's 21 years old. He's a really good player and a great kid. So we're ecstatic the way it turned out with both of those guys. Something I've been asking everyone this week, what do you make of the dynamic at the receiver position? I've seen nothing like it where – there's a supply of great guys every year, round one. Also some guys who hit in round two and beyond. Debo Samuel was a second round pick, DK Metcalf, AJ Brown, for example. And then the guys at the top who show they can do it, getting huge money more than ever before. And if they can't get it from their current teams, they're finding a way to a place that will happily give up significant draft assets and pay the guy what he wants. Both of those dynamics playing out at the same time and teams having to decide, where do I fall in this camp? Do I draft a guy? Do I trade a guy and try to backfill? Why do you think it's gotten to this point at the receiver position where there's these very different approaches to going out and acquiring a guy who plays a position that's becoming more and more important to the offense? Yeah, and I think, you know, Coach Dayball talks about it all the time. You go watch youth football. It's seven on seven. Uh, my son's 12 years old, and – they had, he's a quarterback, they had a wristbands and no huddle offense with signals at 12 years old in youth football, no huddle, and they're throwing the ball around. So that's where the game's going. So, you know, again, it's, it's a spread game. When, when we played Tampa Bay this year, we didn't run the ball one time the entire first half. So it's, it's, it's evolving into, you know, a lot of teams to a passing league. 
And there's definitely a premium on receivers. And then to your point, you see what these guys are getting paid now. So, you know, if you can get one early in the draft, um, you know, that's important because it's cost controlled for four or five years, but there's also a miss rate on receivers. Um, you know, there's 25, 27 drafted every year. And why do some have success and some fizzle out? I mean, you look at the miss rate of receivers. Um, I mean, just look back at the last three or four drafts and the, the first and second rounders there, there is a miss rate there. And, um, you know, I think people take that into account. So you got a proven commodity, you know, exactly what you're getting. And some of those veteran players, you know, that, you, you know, Debo or Hill was just traded, you know, some of those guys that are proven commodities. So, um, trying to balance that, but, you know, again, make sure that you get it right. Have you identified any trends as to what causes the misses among the receivers? I, I just get the impression it's a, it's just a, a stew of factors and you roll the dice and you see what happens, but is there any common thread, you know, size of school, anything, anything that you've seen that makes you think that this is more likely to contribute to a guy busting who goes in round one? Yeah, I think a lot of it is the way they're, they're wired. You know, I was around, I was fortunate enough to be around Steve Smith when I was in Carolina, one of the most competitive players I've ever been around and he's undersized, but every day at practice, he brought it and he let you know, um, Jarvis Landry, when I was in Miami, same deal, um, tremendous practice player, brought it every day, um, very competitive. So I think to me, that's a trade I always look for in receivers because that's going to kind of put you over the edge. If you're super talented and you don't have that competitiveness or the drive to separate yourself from, you know, the 26 other guys that are drafted, I think that's sometimes where you miss. But I think those guys that have the talent and they're wired to be competitive and driven to succeed and be the best at their craft, that's typically where you're going to have success. When I had this conversation with Brandon Bean, he went on and on about the importance of having a number one receiver. You guys, when you were there, traded for Stephon Diggs. And basically, I, I don't know what I would do without him, was essentially what Brandon said. You, your team, before you got there, drafted Kadarius Toney in the first round last year. And I don't, there were some weird reports, and I don't know what was really going on. Was he being shopped? Was he available? I don't know. But where do things stand now in the relationship with him? And do you envision that he can become that number one receiver that the offense is going to need to get to where it wants to be? Yeah. It, Kadarius is a super talented kid. Again, when, when I was interviewing for the job, he was one of the young players. I'm like, I'm really excited to work with this kid. And, you know, he's been here for three weeks now and, you know, he's really bought into what we're doing. He's excited to be here. He's had great energy and he's been really pleasant to work with here. So yes, if, if, it, you know, he missed some games last year because of injury. And again, part of it, you know, dependability and being on the field is important for all these guys. So if he's on the field and he's healthy and when he's right, he definitely has the ability to be a, you know, a, a dynamic playmaker in our offense. Well, we'll see how it all plays out for your first season with the giants. Week one will be here. Before we know it, maybe we'll get a division rival right out of the gates. Maybe we get the Cowboys. Maybe you can show <laughs> Kayvon Thibodeau and Evan Neal in Giants uniform to Jerry Jones. You showed, Jerry, you showed us the board. We'll show you the reality. Here they are. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, we like their draft too. They did a good job too. I, I like those guys, uh, Will McClay and them. But uh, yeah, we'll see. That would, be, that would be a fun one. That'd be a fun one. All right, Joe. Well, hey, we appreciate it. Congratulations again on getting the job. And thanks for some of your time. We look forward to talking to you down the road. All right. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.